This date is uh, close to Ramallah in the occupied Palestinian territories. And I know that there are more than one person here from Palestine. If you're here, raise your hands. I'm very excited to have you here. And uh, this people know how interesting it is to be in that part of the world on all aspects, particularly on caring about education and believing that education is a thing you can carry forward wherever you're sent. After that, I did my master's in computer vision at the University of Leeds, that's northeast of the UK. And I did my PhD then between 2006 and 2009. During my PhD, I worked on a problem that was easy to explain even to my grandma, which is very good. Uh, so I did, I, my work was on bicycle theft detection. So looking at people dropping bikes in in the morning, collecting them up in the evening. In addition to being an interesting computer vision problem, it was a complex combinatorial problem. So looking at linking events that are very far in time. Interestingly, there is very little research on this up to date. And I also did some work on detecting people carrying bags and understanding what people are doing as they walk around. In 2010, I started a three-year postdoc working on an EU project, and we were working on one of the first wearable prototypes. So this is our ET-like style prototype. The thing on the top is this uh, um, prime sensor, so one of the first depth sensors, which we had to mount really high above the ground to be able to monitor the depth. So this was our wearable prototype, but we were able to observe people doing some industrial tasks and give them some guidance, and that forms most of my group's research, as I'll explain later. I started in 2013 as an assistant professor at the University of Bristol, that's southwest of the UK. I became an associate last year, and I am an associate editor of pattern recognition, IET computer vision, and a Nokia research collaborator. My research interests are fundamentally in action understanding, particularly object interaction understanding, and every year we organize the EPIC workshop, Egocentric Perception Interaction in Computing. And as I said, that will be the second half of this morning. If you don't know where Bristol is, so let's put ourselves on the map. Um, so that's London. Bristol is the red big dot to the left. And what you'll see on the top is our university's main building. So that's the church, which is actually the university. And this is our building where our lab is. And like everyone who presents their work, I am actually presenting lots of people's collaborative work that I get the pleasure to come and present. Uh, so lots of credit goes to the group. These are the groups in the first in the three years, and all the people who've done the work that formulates what I'll tell you about. If you want to know more about our group, um, I have an active web page. As I just said, the talk is now already on my web page on this talk. So if you want to track the slides, I have a Twitter account and a LinkedIn account, and I'm not on Facebook. So don't try to find me there. Okay, with that, it is time to start talking about the topic of today. I would like to start by thanking Hussein and the others for organizing this very exciting gathering, tell you more about computer vision uh, and more about how machine learning managed to save computer vision. We were really going downhill until machine learning came on board. And I'll start a little bit in the past and fundamentally understand how this happened even before deep learning. Please stop me at any point in time. I tend to speed up, so if the speed reaches uncomprehensible speeds, just raise your hand and say, let's pause and think again. So yesterday you heard about the fundamental understanding of an image. An image is a bunch of numbers. This is a grayscale image, and on each dot you have a number. Uh, that number tends to represent the color or the shade. If you are in a colored image, there will be three shades of RGB. And computer vision started as a concept in 66. In MIT, there was a professor who decided he's going to solve computer vision over the summer. So he put a, a summer project and told students, look, we do programming, we're really good programmers, can we do a bit of pattern recognition? And he called it the summer vision project. By the end of the summer, he realized this is a far more complex problem and a complete research discipline formulated that was called computer vision. It now covers a wide range of applications. So computer vision is in medical imaging, is in vision for robotics, is in biometrics, is in video understanding and tracking, etc. And as I said in the second half, we focus on one of the main applications, which is video understanding. 
But the first stages of computer vision started by parsing images the way we parse our programs. So if you're in computer science, you know that there are parsers. You take a program, and the parser will read the program and convert it into some binary knowledge. And they started thinking about computer vision in that way. They built parsers. So the image on the left was parsed by this grammar on the right that says a human is formed of a head, a hand, the hand is formed of these sets of edges. And so they built the parser on the right, and they were able to parse the image on the left, reading it as well as understanding it. The problem was you had to build a separate parser for every image. So that didn't seem practical, but the computer was parsing images. And this continued for a while, becoming slightly more smarter. So the example on the left is saying, yes, we can parse images, but they don't need to be exactly in the same location. There are these springs that they can move around, but I still need to parse the face into being some hair, some eyes, with a bit of movement around. And you can parse, then you can take an image, go through the parser and say, I detected the head here and the face here. And that continued on and on. For every new object, we had to build a parser. And they, this is like the Genome Project, one of the successful computer vision solutions in the 80s, that said most of man-made objects were made of genomes on the left. So I can form, let's say, a lamp out of one object of number four on top of one object of number three, and I can parse the lamp accordingly. In the meanwhile, while computer vision was trying to do parsing of individual images, there was another field being developed. And I believe Hussein is the reminder me the first note of the word machine learning was in 59. And it was designed as this field of study that tries to learn without being explicitly programmed. So that's 59, while computer vision all the way to the 80s was still parsing or programming explicitly. In 1990s, beginning of 1990s, that's when things changed. That's when people thought about using machine learning for computer vision. And this was the initial formulation. If you can see the images, it's a fairly old uh, slide. And it is to try to detect computer screens. So these are very, very old computer screens. And what it says is, if we have patches, actual parts of the image, I can form these as features, and then I can give them labels, where in this case, minus one means that patch does not have a computer screen, plus one means it does. And now, the training data will be lots of image patches, and I hope to generalize to the testing. And the concept is to build this classification function f, that can take the features x, and produce some predicted labels, y hat, and I want to minimize the classification error. That's trying to check for as many of my training images as possible that Y, which is the label, is the same as Y hat, which is the predicted label. And things shifted completely. And the question was, is there still a need for computer vision? Because this is foundational machine learning. I have some X, and I'm building a function to predict the Y. Very quickly, in the 1990s, similar to the deep learning pipe these days, there were lots of papers that were published in computer vision that were saying machine learning solutions outperformed these parsing solutions. And papers and papers, one after the other, said machine learning is better, machine learning is better, and machine learning became a core part of computer vision. And every machine learning algorithm was tested on some form of a computer vision problem. And then the visual data became also a new source for machine learning people to produce new algorithms that are outperforming in computer vision but not necessarily in other data problems. And in fact, you know, the rise of deep learning is because vision data became foundational parts of testing machine learning algorithms. The first success of why people heard about computer vision though Far, is far before deep learning or the deep learning era. In 2001, the Viola Jones face detector was published. Now, how many of you have heard of the Viola Jones face detector? Okay, less than you should. This was, this was the main reason 
computer vision became on the map. And this is a piece of news from 2006, so five years after the paper was published. Nikon, which was a digital camera back then, before phones took over, published this paper that said, Fun face hunting cameras boost the sales of Nikon. And what this did is that the camera, we were able to pull the camera up and the camera would produce a red box around the face of the human. Now this algorithm is in every phone, right? Now you put your phone up and you have this small box that highlights a face. Incorrectly, in this news item, they were referring this as a face recognition technology. Now we know that this is not called face recognition, it's face detection. So I know there is a face, I don't know who the person is. Face recognition is giving an identity to the face rather than detecting its presence. So this was a face detection algorithm that became superior, that it is until now on your phones, and it is exactly in the form it was published in 2001. And that gives you some aspect of the scale of how research transforms into applications. So the paper was published in 2001, it was not until 2012, 2013 that we saw it on our phones. So if you're looking at the latest research, we still say, despite the speed of machine learning, that this is 10 years down the line of applications. And I'll tell you about the biology on space detector, because I believe this was the reason computer vision became prominent, that it became interest in industry and in academia to do lots of research, to introduce computer vision as a fundamental course in undergraduate and master's degree. And I'm not sure how clear you can see things, but I don't know if you can see all these red bounding boxes around all the faces in the image. And if you can imagine, this was the publication, or this was the product of that work in 2001. And the credit goes to two people, Paul Viola and Michael Jones. I always like to put people's pictures rather than only their names, because they are just researchers who work there. And coincidentally, between 2001 and 2002, both of them were in Merle, so the Mitsubishi Research Lab in the US. They coincided at the same time producing, again, the most successful computer vision based on machine learning solution. Currently, Paul Viola leads the machine learning team in Amazon, while Michael Jones is still at Merle. And what they did is they started from these low resolution images, and they produced what we call filters. So filters are these funny looking black and white sliders, which they can go and look through the image, change their position, orientation, slide them around the image towards producing an understanding of, let's say, the eyebrows, the hairline, the nose, the mouth, and the presence of all these individual components tells you that there's potentially a face. So that was their features. Currently, we refer to that as handcrafted features, in the sense that they designed what they believe the interesting features would be. And then for every feature of their potential features, let's say in this case, it is this one, so it's a white thing surrounded by a full black um, rectangle, they were multiplying that very smartly, very efficiently, using integral images, I'm not going to talk about how they efficiently do the sliding, but they actually slide that feature over the full image, produce a response map, which is where they think that feature has a response for. And they would do that for, let's say, n features, producing lots of responses. And then they needed some positive training data and negative training data. When they wrote the Viola and Jones detector, they were not targeting faces in particular. However, its success is primarily in face detection. Their training data was this bunch of images. And to believe that it worked using this small number of training data is impressive. What they did is an imbalanced training data with 10,000 negative examples and only a few positive examples. If you do anything in machine learning now, they tell you start with a balanced data set. So the same number of examples per class. However, there are algorithms that were only successful because they produced far more negative examples than positive. So do question this balanced data set assumption. The next thing was how would they do this classification? How would they decide on a face? 
and the classifier was called the Adaboost classifier. Again, if you are from, if you worked in Google Revision for deep learning, this was like extremely fashionable. So the concept is you just need a collection of weak classifiers. Weak classifiers are classifiers that produce something better than 50%. 50% is random. Better than 50% is close to random. But I'm not optimizing my classifier perfectly. I'm just finding a weak classifier. And I'm finding a collection of weak classifiers that together combine to form a strong classifier. Boosting is this iterative algorithm that repeatedly constructs a set of weak classifiers to form a strong classifier based on the previous hypothesis. Again, just seeing how research formulates. The concept of Adaboost was in 95. It was used in detection in 2001, came to our phones in 2011. So if you want to do research, look a little bit far in the past and find something out there. It's not about reinventing the wheel. There are lots of research out there. Just formulate your problem, find the relevant solutions. Right, so the concept is you have this feature output, and that feature output tells you weekly where, in this case, a computer screen would be. Then you sum these weak classifiers. Each one of them is fairly bad, saying anywhere here is potentially a computer screen. That's another weak classifier that just outperforms random. And then you kind of add them up until you get a strong classifier that detects the actual location of the object in the image. And it does this as follows. In this example, the red is your positive examples, the blue is your negative examples. And the first thing is you just produce a linear classifier, so a line that separates the two examples and does better than random. So you say, OK, if I'm going to have a vertical line, where can I put it? This is the best possible threshold, but it's not optimal. It's very far from optimal. It's a weak classifier. You then boost the error. You say, all these examples now are incorrectly classified. I give them an additional weight in my minimization. So basically, I'm exactly boosting them up. And then I try to train another weak classifier. Now this weak classifier shrinks those, they're now the combination of these two linear classifiers works for the majority of the examples. But again, I boost further the remaining incorrect ones, and I keep going until I get a collection of weak classifiers that form a strong classifier. So this is exactly what was happening in the images. This is what is currently happening on your phones. You have a full image. And what it does is that it quickly gets rid in a very first round of lots of patches that definitely don't have a face. And over time, it is dropping using the additional classifiers. It's dropping more and more patches until you end up with the locations of the face. Right. The impressive bit about the biological detector is the speed at which it operates again in 2001. It was operating on these tiny images 384 times 288, but in 2001, it was doing that in 0.067 seconds. And that's how the industry got attention. I can just put the thing up, and I can get the face detection. Viola and Jones published their work and made their code publicly available for free. They gave a free implementation of it on what's called OpenCV, which is still one of the popular location to find lots of computer vision algorithms to be implemented. And that's why, and they have no track, they, they don't get any payments for producing the algorithm. And that's why all the computer phone, all the phone companies can use a freely available Viola Benz detector to give you the ability to track. And they really wanted to push computer vision. They thought if we do that, that's going to attract lots of people's attention to computer vision, and they were definitely successful in that. And I believe that's when the age of computer vision has begun. And that's when we believe machine learning, because what they did is a collection of classification concepts and feature extractions. That's when machine learning saved computer vision, and we became a popular topic for research. Right. With this introduction of a machine learning solution for a computer vision task came the need for labeled training data. If I want to produce this for any number of examples, I need lots of training data. And I remember in 2006, what was called the Pascal Challenge became popular. 
people labeled 5,000 images with what could be 9,000 objects by carefully hand labeling the bounding box and giving these objects a label. They also gave it more information like is it front, is it the front of the car or the side view of the car. So there was a lot of effort from lots of people around Europe because Pascal it was a European network to produce the first solution, the first actually large scale labeled data set for multiple classes. So this is not only faces, but a multi class classification problem. So the Pascal solution was one of the first ones. So what they did is they wanted to understand um, they wanted to understand objects in human captured images. So they came with Flickr images. They basically mined these 5,000 Flickr images. Probably they mined around 10,000. Then they asked human annotators to, to decide whether their categories, which were around 20 categories, exist in that image. That gave them their 5,000. Then there are PhD students who sat around desks labeling very fine-grained bounding boxes. And I am pleased to know that I was one of those bunches of people. So Mark Erringham, one of the leaders of, of the Pastor Challenge, was at Leeds when I was a PhD student. And we had summer projects where we had like the summer school. But in addition to the talks in the morning, all of us would be sitting around labeling bounding boxes. Luckily, we stopped doing that because in two... Okay, let me tell you first about what happened. Quality of the labels are very, very important. That's why I said in this case, this was hand-labeled by computer vision, people who knew what computer vision was about. There was a lot of process of quality check. This was labeled first by a PhD student or a researcher, passed into another one to check it, to refine it, and a third person to confirm it. This was excessive. Luckily, we're not in that business anymore. Luckily, we can do far, far more weaker label. But the Pascal Challenge became this huge competition where all the research groups in the world were producing what is now the PR care. So they were trying to outperform. Basically, if you are exactly on the on this perfect sorry, on this perfect y x-axis, you are 100 percent The closer you are to the corner on the top left, the better your solution was. And as you can see, the improvement was slow. So the dotted black line was what we call the baseline, right? So that's the baseline algorithm that was out there. And then groups were producing slowly 0.1% improvement, 1% improvement, 2% improvement. And that's why now in computer vision, because of this obsessive thing with data sets, we cannot publish unless we outperform on some data set. We're now on the extreme case where like only the results count rather than the interest in data. So this will be balanced slowly. In 2009, a few years later, became a completely different solution to the labeling problem, which was called ImageNet. How many of you have heard about ImageNet? Yeah, I'm guessing that's like, this is the, the popular trend now. ImageNet was a bit different. It labeled 10,000 categories without bounding boxes. So it just labeled the presence of that object in the bounding box. However, the images were fairly focused. So the object was centered in the image, the majority of the image was the object, but it didn't need lots of checks, right? Does the object exist or not? And the image solution in 2009, again, there were competitions and people were trying to improve results until in 2012, that's the major breakthrough, when this was won. So until 2012, everybody this, did this two-step approach, deciding what features you'd like to use, than using a suitable classifier. Similar to what the Viola and Jones have done. Decide on your filters, find your classifier in their case, the Ada Boost. In 2012, both the machine learning and the computer vision communities were surprised by a very, very successful algorithm that improved not 1%, 2%, but 10% over what was the state of the art, winning the ImageNet challenge by far, and that was CNN. Right, so the trend you know about CNN is the outcome of understanding machine learning, producing lots of labeled data, improving our labeled data, and then a solution that came from the back. If you talk to any people in the machine learning community, they will tell you, as you know, that neural networks had been there for a while. 
So this was the latecomer unexpected solution. Um, they, Jan Lacroon and the others who had been working on CNNs for a while, they were ignored, they could not publish for more than 10 years, so they were not producing good results. And then AlexNet, a student called Alex, is a very, very good software engineer, took the ideas, implemented them, won the challenge, and the world was turned upside down, and deep learning started. Right, so from then on, CNNs outperformed the traditional computer vision solution on almost all problems. And that's why the remaining of the talk will be on CNNs. It's very important to give you the background because you'll see that the concept of filters and the concept of weak classifiers is what is now in CNNs. And again, deep machine learning further saved computer vision, producing further solutions beyond the main success, which is the way all of Any questions before we go into CNNs? How many of you believe that you got 80% of what we said so far? Okay, just for me to know that we're on the right path. Please stop and ask. CNNs, deep neural networks, and I believe Hamza yesterday showed you lots of fully connected convolutions. There are three popular types of deep neural networks to date. The fully connected deep neural network, the convolutional deep neural network, and I believe tomorrow you're going to hear in details about the recurrent deep neural networks. CNNs are accredited for this recent success in neural networks, and it was first used in 1989 by Dan LeCun as a concept um, in, this, in his paper, Generalized and Network Design Strategies, but again, it was only used in 2012 onwards after it won the ImageNet Challenge. CNNs expect a certain type of data. You don't use CNNs for anything. You use it if your data comes in some form of a grid-like topology. Grid-like means some sort of a matrix, 1D, 2D, or 3D matrices. So you can use it for, say, audio. So audio is a one-dimensional grid-like amount of data. You can use it for images, which is a two-dimensional grid-like data. Or you can use it for video, which is a 3D dimensional data, etc. The input is grid-like. That makes the operations you can perform on that input. It might apply to different parts of the grid cell. And accordingly, CNN is a neural network that has the form of convolution, which I'll tell you now about, at least in one of its layers. So if you have a fully connected layer that has at least one convolution layer, we start calling it a CNN. So this is reminding you of what you heard before. I'm skipping anything to do with biases, with this plus B you heard. So assume that is a given. But the concept is you have input X, and you have W, which is a set of weights. And then you want to multiply the input by some trained weights. So X is the input, W is the kernel, or the feature, or the filter, or whatever you want to call it. Traditionally, as we said, the Biola and Bose uh, Jones face detector, these kernels were manually defined. In CNNs, these kernels were finally tuned and trained as part of the optimization. Moreover, instead of using one or a few kernels, we used multiple kernels, and they were dependent on one another. So they were trained jointly to produce some features that are suitable for the application, but they were a multiple set of dependent filters or kernels. Right, so X is this multiple dimensional array, W is the kernel, and because we have multiple Ws, so we have a set of kernels, we call that a tensor. And that's where tensor flow and all the concept of tensors became a book. Right. This is the convolutional operator. So what you have is an X, an input, and a W, and what you're multiplying is a certain position, M, N, multiplied by the inverse location of your weight. So it is I minus M, J minus N, so the location. So basically you're flipping your W vertically and horizontally before you're doing the multiplication. This is the convolutional operator. You do this flips to allow it to be cumulative. 
So you do this flip to be able to say x convoluted by w is the same as w convoluted by x. Theoretically, you do this flipping, and that allows you to produce lots of interesting theoretical ways of convoluting. The only reason we do this flipping is because it's really helpful in proofs. However, practically, if you look at TensorFlow or PyTorch, we don't use the convolution operator. We actually use the cross-correlation operator. So we basically keep the matrices in the same order and we just multiply them. So even though we still call them convolutional CNNs, convolutional neural networks, they do not use a convolution operator. This is an underlying trick, but it's a normal cross-correlation. That means you have your kernel, in this case the 2 by 2 kernel, W, X, Y, Z, which we put on the input. So we're putting the kernel on top of the first position in the input and we're multiplying. So A times W plus B times X plus E times Y plus F times Z. And then we slide our convolution or cross-correlation filter until we produce our solution of the output. Input kernel, cross-correlation, and sliding both horizontally and vertically. This concept is the same as what the Viola and Jones and all the computer vision people have done. It's just that this is a trained weight matrix as opposed to a hand-designed weight matrix. Right. I'll go down to why CNNs are interesting um, and saying that CNNs have three differences to, to fully connected layers. They have sparse interactions, they share parameters, and they have a set of equivalent representations. This is from the famous Goodfellows book. So if you're confused about any of, them, any of these fundamentals, you can go to chapter 9 in Ian Goodfellows. But I believe the set of slides are going to be slightly easier to follow, fingers crossed. Right, this is a fully connected layer. In this case, I am just drawing it bottom to top. So the input is at the bottom, and they have a set of fully connected connections to the top. You could have designed it left to right, it was the same concept. What they did is, so in fully connected layers, any output is a multiplication of a set of weights with all the inputs. So that means to produce S1, you need five weights for the five inputs, or n weights for the n inputs. Similarly, each input contributes to all the outputs. This is fully connected. CNNs were trying to do things slightly differently, saying instead of X3 contributing to all the outputs, maybe it's enough for X3 to contribute to the outputs nearby and can ignore the outputs further. This is called sparse interactions. With sparse interactions, you can see how many lines I have kind of crossed out out of the fully connected ones. Now you have only a set of potential inputs. So X3 only contributes to a set of potential outputs. And similarly, each output has a subset of the inputs to which it contributes. These are called the receptive field of the output. So which of the inputs really contributes to deciding that particular output? The interesting aspect of CNNs is when you build layers. So even though in the first layer you have a small receptive field, with sparse interactions, as I go deeper in the network, the receptive field increases in size. Right. So this is the first set of receptive fields, a shallow network, a deeper network, you're going to a bigger receptive field. Is this as a concept new? No. The concept of pyramid images had existed in computer vision before. But this was now fundamentally as part of the learning process. Second, parameter sharing. First, we threw lots of connections. Two, we started thinking about those weights. Remember, our input is some sort of a grid-like. So the question was, is this weight W that links X1 to S1 different from the weight W2 that linking X2 to S2? Maybe I can tie them together and say they are one set of weights. Because again, we think about grid-like, think about an audio signal. Right? You can think that as I slide into my audio, this weight that always contributes the output to the exactly same input could be tied together. Now you're dropping one weight because you're saying they are the same set of weights. 
And remember, weights is what we want to optimize. So weights are the unknown. We know the X, we know the Y during learning. What we are tuning or training are the weights. So now I can look throughout and say all these weights are the same. All the blue lines are one set of weights I want to train. All the red ones are another set of weights I want to train. They contribute all the XI to X, SI plus one. And similarly, all the green ones are the same. And the amount of training parameters I needed to do drops significantly. So the number of num parameters I need to do is now three out of a huge number of five times five, 25. So basically, I am dropping the number of parameters I need to train, in this case, to 12%. In real CNNs, you're dropping them to less than 1% of the number of parameters in fully connected layers. Any questions? Yes? How do we decide which way are going to be shared and which are it is, the, it is the position, right? So it is your understanding of what a grid-like structure does. So you are believing that you can slide that operator throughout, as you see. So you're believing that every SI has the same concept that comes from XI. So this is the same position. So it is by position that you believe these are going to be shared. Right. Notice that decreasing the number of parameters does not change anything about the time it does to go through. So you still have to do all the multiplications is that the number of parameters you need to tune is different, the size of the model is different, the memory requirements are different, but not the running time in the forward or the backward passes. So you have significantly less parameters to train, and thus you need far less data to train it, and that's how CNN is managed to successfully outperform the NNs in many, or fully connected layers, in many cases. But again, this assumption, you can just drop things. It has to come from your understanding that your data has some sort of a, some sort of a grid-like structure. Let's look at what happens. So we said these weights are shared. So blue is the same throughout, red is the same throughout, and green is the same throughout. Colors might not be that clear for you. So you have these three weights, which you are multiplying by the input. And it's the same set of weights throughout. Right? It's the same set of weights to R. Where have we seen this concept before? That's what the poor Viola and Jones have been doing for a while, right? Putting this filter and sliding it throughout. And this is exactly the concept of parameter sharing in CNN. You have a set of filters, you have the same set of weights, and you are multiplying them throughout. In this case, I showed you a 1D solution for visualization, but you can think of a 2D solution. In this case, this is your filter, a three by three set of weights, for example. This is your input. This is your weight sharing. So you do have a fully connected layer, but you have tied weights. And then you're sliding it throughout to produce some output, and you apply the cross-correlation thing. So you actually multiply six times one plus four times two, etc. Okay, so we said sparse interactions, sharing weights, and what forms CNN. And as a result of these two properties, CNN has some interesting good advantages. We call them equivalents. Because we have shared or tied weights, a shift in the input produces the same shift in the output. So if I take my image, or whatever is the 1D or 2D grid, and I shift it to the right, the response also shifts to the right. Right? It's the output of the concept. If I'm shifting the input, the output will get shifted in exactly the same way. This allows CNNs to be translation invariant. That means it's going to give me the same response wherever the object's position is. Translation invariant is very important in us as a concept. Because in our human eyes, as I shift, things are going to shift, but I still understand them. It's not changing my understanding of images. So we were always looking for a computer vision solution that's translation invariant. CNN gave us this by default as an outcome of the change in the understanding of shared parameters. However, CNNs are not rotation invariant, they are not scale invariant. 
So if I take my object and I rotate it, the response is not going to rotate. And accordingly, CNNs work very well on images captured by a human, because we're doing the trick. We're actually fixing the camera and taking a good image, which we pass into the CNN, which is not rotation in time. However, if you take a random image, so if you take your phone and you start shifting it significantly, not a little bit, your face detector, all the concept of what works in CNNs will stop working. So CNNs are relying on us taking good images to be able to do object detection, for example. <coughs> right. So that's what, let me see if this is actually, for some reason this is not working, let's try again. Okay. This should give you some filters, but it's not, it's fine. So this is just showing the sliding of the filter and producing the multiple filters. Okay, so what do we have? We have now a set of convolutions. This is a convolutional filter. We're sliding that on an image and producing some response. But as we said, we don't have one input or one filter. We have lots of filters, and that gives you these layers in the CNN. So let's say you have 32 filters, 64 filters. There are lots of filters in every layer of the CNN. Each filter is, looks independent, but because they are trained jointly, they're not going to be exactly the same. They're going to collaborate to produce the output. So they are trained jointly, but they are actually different kernels or different filters. Usually, there is an additional thing that we do when we multiply the image, multiplying the image is called zero padding. And I'll go to the example to kind of make sure that we look at this. If you can see the input, the input is 5 by 5. The output after I do the multiplication is 3 by 3. If I actually keep doing that, the image is going to shrink and shrink and shrink until it disappears. To solve that problem, we usually do what we call zero padding. So we add zeros around, so the input and output can be of the same size. And even though this is a fundamentally easy trick, it actually changed things, because we could do deeper layers than what we could do before we did zero padding. We were limited by the number of layers before zero padding was introduced. So with the zero padding, the input and the output and zero padding is as trivial as I say it, adding zeros and up. Yes? Right, so the kernel or the filter or the convolution are these numbers that we're going to train and then multiply by the input and slide around. These are our filters, which in the case of, let's say, the biologist was detected, they were hand labeled. Now they are trained. So what I want to train effectively are these numbers. These are the weights I want to multiply by my input to produce an output. In 1D, these are these three weights, W1, W2, W3. The numbers, the weights. In 2D, they are, let's say, three by three numbers that I multiply by a 2D input. They, no, they will be trained. So they are, you can start them from random, you can think of the CNN, eventually you have lots of, lots of weights to train, but your loss function is what's going to train them throughout. So you can start from random numbers, multiply, produce an output. You look at the output, you say that output is meaningless. I don't know what's here, but this is my actual label. What should I do to train these weights to produce something that will tell me this is a dog or this is a cat? So I go and change these numbers in a fairly structured way, Right? You can change them randomly, that's going to take forever. Right? You can change them randomly. You can kind of say, let me now establish this at Usually there are millions of parameters in your CNN. And you can keep changing them forever until you get the best solution. However, people here doing optimization tell you, we have much, much better solutions, like stochastic gradient descent, or like momentums, etc., so that you can tune them faster. But practically, I'm looking for these numbers to produce the output I'm looking for. Again, if you hear the word kernel, filter, feature, it's the same. It's these numbers that I want to train. Or not rotation or scaling variant. There exists some research on that. Yes. 
Yes, so there are some solutions to produce some translation invariant CNNs. However, accuracy wise, accuracy wise, they still don't compete with the typical translation invariant CNN. So they're still under research, I would say. The typical CNN is translation invariant. Rotation invariant are tricks we're adding on top to produce some rotation invariant. They're not fundamental to the concept of CNNs. Maybe more of them will come into play, but as long as we have filters and we multiply and slide, the concept is not rotation invariant. But yes, there are papers out there that are attempting to do rotation invariant. Very good. So immediately after you're going to get all the questions of how you solve rotation invariant so on medical imaging. So do you have a poster or something on board later? No? So they're going to come to ask you individually. Yes. The shift part, the way that we're actually scaling, sliding the image. Again, simple, let's go back to the 1D. That's really important. So the 1D is you have the input, you're multiplying your three weights with the input to produce the output. Then I'm sliding the same set of weights and multiplying them. This is 1D. Imagine the same concept on 2D. I have my filter, I'm putting it on the input, and then I'm actually sliding it. Like moving it one step, doing the multiplication, producing another output. Moving it. The weight tying is what CNN is about. Actually, they're the same set of weights, and I'm moving them around. Right. So that's zero padding. After you do the convolution, another trick came on board called activation functions. Activation functions are nonlinear transformations of your linear set of weights. And they are one of the most famous ones is review activation function. And in research, we're really bad at producing something that looks as trivial as it actually is. The review is a function that says anything that's negative make it zero, anything that's positive keep it as is. Or we like to complicate things, so we call it the real activation function. There are other activation functions that work. However, the real is the most successful one. Why do we need these activation functions? If I don't have activation functions, I am multiplying a set of layers. However, I can actually collapse them by producing one filter that's a multiplication of all my filters. I don't really have deep networks if I don't have activation functions. If that goes on top of your head, just kidding. If you're interested, it's actually the reason why we can produce deep neural networks. Because each layer is now non-linear, and accordingly you can't really collapse all their layers to one another. So what you have is, this is the output of your multiplication, where black is negative, white is positive, and the real activation layer is basically just getting rid of the negatives. After we do the activation and the convolution and the activation, usually CNNs have something we call the pooling layer. And that changes the size of your filter. That changes your receptive field. And the pooling is the same concept you can think about. The pooling is basically taking the set of images and producing some average of them. The most popular pooling trick is max pooling, not average pooling. That means I have first gotten rid of all the negatives, and then I'm looking for the biggest positive value. That's the biggest response. I'm really looking for some form of response. And max pooling is something that changes, in this case, a 4 by 4 into a 2 by 2 by taking a grid and deciding for each grid the maximum response function. And that forms the first layer of the CNN. And then you can have a new set of weights which you can apply on top of the output. Activation, <coughs> pooling, and that gives you the second convolutional layer. And you can produce more and more convolutional layers. And you see lots of techniques referring to the number of convolutional layers in their name. VGG 16. 16 convolutional layers. ResNet 101. 101 convolutional layers. There is nothing that says deeper is always better. And you can look at research to understand at which areas has deeper proven to be more valuable. A third convolutional layer. I'm not sure how many convolutions we're going to try in today's lab, but definitely more than one. 
However, CNNs definitely at the end have to have some form of a fully connected layer to make a decision. So after we do all the convolutions, we typically do what we call reshaping. So we take this two and two data and we just stretch it into a 1D vector. In that output, this is just reshaping, there are no weights here. From that output, I can produce one or more fully connected layers towards my output. That is then grouping everything in the image and making a decision of whether in this case I am having a binary classifier of whether this image was taken in Rome or not. All the tricks you heard about yesterday on binary loss functions or multi-class loss functions are added at the very end. Yeah. The pooling is going to drop the size for sure. And there are, there are methods that don't do pooling. However, pooling is really good to find some sort of a scale invariance in some bigger receptive field. Typically, pooling exists, but again, without zero padding, we would have even less layers. Look at architectures that have and don't have pooling. Typically, most common architectures do have max pooling. They can have it, I'm not going to overcomplicate things, but they can have it without what you call a strike. So they can have it densely. You can still do max pooling and not decrease the size. But that's not popular. Popular is decreasing the size. It's not, well, most CNNs don't keep the original size because their, their decision is usually a class. Mm. You can look at things like autoencoders where you actually have an output the same as the input, yeah. but they still decrease the size to find some sort of another dimension and then increase. Mm. It's very un unusual to have the same size input output throughout. The only thing I kind of didn't mention today is that usually images are 3D as input, so the first convolution layer is not a 2D filter, it's a 3D filter that looks across RGMB. But that's technicality. Right. Um, where are we with time? I should have tried. Is that correct? Okay. As we said, AlexNet, so Alex, which is actually the name of the student who did this, won the ImageNet challenge to classify 1,000 classes, as well as 1,000 dimensions, from 10,000 training images of the ImageNet challenge, and his architecture was fairly complex. You might have seen some of these images before. Let's try to decode them based on what you've understood, and hopefully by the end you can decipher the, the knowledge. What do we have here? We have an image. This is our input. In this case, the AlexNet is 224 times 224. We have our filter that's 11 by 11. This is the weight I want to train. This is the one I want to slide over. What they're drawing here is the output of this convolution. And they have 48 filters. So it's 48 11 by 11 output to produce these layers. This drawing is the same as what we've seen here when I'm plotting them as layers, right? The blue ones. But usually, when they draw CNNs, they plot them like this. These are the different layers of your output. They look like a 3D tensor. Again, your input, your filter size, the number of filter sizes is here, right? There is max pooling. Look at what the output is. The output is 55 times 55, right? So there is a max pooling in the AlexNet. Second layer. Assume the ReLU exists. ReLU exists without being drawn. There is always some sort of a non-linear architecture. I think it was 10 action Alex Knight. Now it's ReLU. Okay. Next step. We have a 5 by 5 by 48 filter. So this is a 3D filter. It's not a 2D, this is a 3D filter of size. 5 times 5 times 48. And we have 128 of these. Start counting the number of parameters, huh? We're sharing weights, but we're still having lots of parameters to train. Again, we're in the second layer. The size of your convolution is 5 times 5, and you have times 48. This is the convolution block. And you have 128 of these, because each convolution produces one number here. It is not trivial. So if it looks complex, it is because it doesn't look easy to draw these things. 
Next layer, if you're with us, that's great. We have now 3 times 3 times 128 as the filter size. And we have 192 of these. And there is max pooling. See how max pooling is helping us because we're decreasing the size. Again, the final set of filters is 3 times 3 times 192. And we have 128 of these. We're already in the millions of parameters. Alex, to produce AlexNet, thought you can't have only one CNN. So he actually produced two CNN, which are then concatenated to make a decision. We no longer do that. But this was the initial solution. The parameters were initialized randomly and adapted using the loss function. Now, if you're in computer vision, we tell you, start with the AlexNet or the VGG parameters on ImageNet and fine tune from there, because typically you don't have a large enough dataset. However, if your dataset is large enough, or is very different from ImageNet, ImageNet pre-training doesn't help. From the AlexNet architecture came lots of new architectures. So this is just a rewrite of the AlexNet architecture. This is the VGG16 architecture, more complex, more parameters. And you're going to hear about so many architectures out there. The design of these architectures is still handcrafted. It's still some sort of a black art. There are techniques to adapt them, change them, compress them. But there isn't really a button you can press to produce the best possible architecture for your solution. Yes. These architectures are convolutional, so they're used for anything that is grid-like. These are used for images, they have been used for videos, there are very similar architectures to use for audio, but they come always with the concept that they are grid-like. And thus you can share parameters and do sparse interaction. Right, before we take a break, Let's talk a little bit about training CNN. Assume you have the architecture, you adopted the AlexNet architecture, you believe in it, and now you want to train it for a different problem than the ImageNet solution. Training CNNs, usually the hardest part is to train the filters. The fully connected layers are easy to train. The filters are really hard to train. And again, there are tricks that say, don't change your filters, just change your fully connected layers. Not ideal, but if you're desperate for GPUs, that might be your solution. When performing gradient descent, every gradient step requires that you take the input, you multiply all the weights all the way to the end, you calculate your loss, you calculate the gradient, and you go back all the way, and you do that in batches, because you can't do that across the whole set of images. There are many ways to make things easier in training CNNs. People say you can just train one layer at a time. Freeze everything, train one layer at a time. People say start from some pre-trained features on a bigger data set that you can find out there. Some say use random features, completely random, and train fully connected layers. There are papers say that that is the best. Use some handcrafted features to start with. So start from Gabor filters, let's say. You can apply some sort of k-means to your data to give you some initial clusters for your features. All of these approaches were very popular before we started scaling datasets. So now we don't use any of these unless we're desperate. Now people tell you in machine learning, how big is your data? Not enough? Go and collect. Just collect more data. Don't worry about these. Because if you have enough data, you're going to outperform any of these tricks. Not pre-trained. There are methods that say that completely random features, if you have enough of them, can produce the same results as fine-tuning. Random weights. You only train, you only tune your fully connected layers. But you have enough random weights. Completely. It looks crazy, but it does work. You need, you need lots of random weights. And then you just rely on the forward pass on just tuning the fully connected layers. It's great, but yeah, there are papers that say that. 
During training, you always look at something that looks like this. You have your loss, how good is your solution is, and you have the epochs, you're going through the data, and you hope that your loss starts decreasing. It's optimal, ideal, you're gonna never see this nice loss curve. What you will typically use, see, where are we? Is something that looks like this, something that wiggles, and that's because we use batches. We can never optimize on all our data. Because we use batches, we accept that we are just wiggling, but we should be going in the, in the right direction. If it's wiggling but not going in the right direction, it's not training. But wiggling is acceptable as long as your wiggles are not too big. And then you try to train your first CNN and things go crazy. And that's where you start reading about tricks of how to check what happens to your training error. These are very, very general tricks, uh, but it's all you learn it by practice. With years, you start looking at the curve and you know what's wrong. And that's probably something that you reach if you haven't already. Because you see something that looks crazy, it's all about what we call the hyperparameters. The hyperparameters are things like the learning rate, the loss function, the parameters in your loss function, weights in your loss function. And the concept of training a CNN is finding this correlation between how you change your parameter and the effect of that parameter changing on several things. One is on your training loss. The other is on your test loss. You don't want it to be perfect for your training and horrible for your testing. And you heard about overfitting. So while you change your hyperparameter, you have to keep in mind that you need some form of understanding of its effect on your test set, as well as its effect on computational resources. Sometimes changing the hyperparameter means more or less resources, more or less runtime. And a hyperparameter could be the number of layers in your convolution. Right. Batch training is one thing you have to worry about when you're training your CNN. And there are two extremes to batch training. One, backpropagate on, from one image at a time. That's one extreme. The other extreme, is train on your whole data set. Batch-based training is somewhere in the middle. Every batch has, I don't know, 64 images, 128 images. It's a subset of your big data set. Again, it's something to argue in research. Big names like Yan Lekun claim that if your algorithm is good, you can train from a single image. Right? So there are big shots that say batch training is useless. However, the majority of the population still believes that batch-based training is the way forward. The number of images in your batch is referred to as your batch size. Typically, you want to train your batches randomly. However, there are techniques for certain reasons where you want to select the images in your batch more wisely. Read about hard mining as a very popular technique to train on your hardest images. Read about curriculum learning as a way to train on your easiest images, etc., etc. Typically, this is your first event, choose your batches randomly. The effect of changing the batch size is usually has direct effect on the amount of wiggles in your curve. If it's wiggling too much, your batch is very small. If it's not wiggling at all, your batch might be too big. Too big is usually not a problem, but yeah. You might just be using too many resources unnecessarily. General guidance. Larger batches have a better approximation of your full data. Go for larger if you have the GPU. However, as the batch size increases, it's not a linear increase in your loss of accuracy. It's going to plateau at some point. Due to the parallel processing, it's a limitation usually of how much you can put in the batch because of your GPU size. Remember, the GPU or the GPU RAM is keeping lots of things. It's keeping your batch, your model, it's actually keeping the weights of each of your data points as it goes through the forward and the backward pass. Usually, our limitation is the RAM of the GPU size. Right? So if you have a GPU, you're starting and someone tells you, your GPU has two gigabytes of GPU RAM, ask them to change it immediately. You're not doing deep learning until they improve the GPU size, the RAM size. This is a precondition. 
Uh, we've done four and six. Four and six are sensible. We work with video, so we are usually in trouble. So we go to the 11 and 12. It depends on, if you're in images, six would work. And there are good sixes that go on actual laptops as well as on PCs. Ask for a six to start with. Right, so 
So training CNNs on a new problem is far from trivial, give it time. It is not as dark art as it used to be a few years ago. So now we know some tricks. And to conclude. Right, you've had a crash course in CNNs. You know almost everything you need to know about CNNs up to date. Importantly, you know how it fits into computer vision pre and post. CNNs did not fall from the sky. The concept of filters and convolutions came from hard efforts to do handcrafted features. In the next lecture, I'm going to go beyond CNNs and tell you about videos and the work we do within my group. So we're going to do this big shift, assuming you know what CNNs are about. So now we're going to say we trained a CNN and you know what that implies. I believe during the lab, you're going to get a good hardcore training on writing your first CNN. There are lots of tutorials out there on how to do a CNN. However, I always advise you to start by reading a bit of theory. Because that's what makes a difference. Otherwise, you're just copying code without figuring out how to actually adjust it. Most of the material is based in Ian Goodfellow's very, very good book. This is the textbook we use at the University of Bristol to teach deep learning. And it's a fairly, I wouldn't say an easy read, but it's a very clear read. If you have a background of machine learning, reading about CNNs from the Ian Goodfellow's book should be doable with a bit of patience and a long summer. Any questions? Yes. More parameters, you need more data. 
all those more parameters, very good, but you need more data. And eventually, you need to make a decision. Right? You're going to combine them to make a decision. So it might take a hit on your case. Rotate the kernels. As I said, you can rotate the kernels and tie the weights across. Think about rotating the kernels. You can't actually rotate the same kernel, because if you take the same kernels, it's going to be the same weights. Right? It's rotate the kernel while tying the weights or produce the same set of features. Again, there's so much research on rotation. But what you think about your input, that means the same weight will be multiplied throughout. Right? Read about, yeah, read about rotation and diet. It's a very, very hot topic. Very hot topic. We're yet to find problems for which rotation and variance is so fundamental that we're happy to take the hit in accuracy. Mm -hmm. Gonna take another last question before we break someone else. I'll come back to you, yeah. Uh, for the batch training, uh, I didn't understand how that work. How does batch training do? So, uh, so stochastic gradient descent, gradient descent is this concept of taking the gradient and going and changing your weights. Stochastic gradient descent is to do it not on all your data, but on a subset of your data at each point in time. That subset is formally known as the batch. Yes. Right? That subset is formally known as the batch. So that means you take your images, a subset, let's say 16 images, you do the forward pass, you take the loss, you take the average change in your weights, and you apply that average change. Okay, but the X the inputs, you take image by image. By image. You take it image by image, and the, the you go through, uh, so you see the effect of your weight changes, yes. and you see the average, typically, the average change of weights that successfully applies to all your images. Okay. Look at implementation. Some people take it as tensors, so they put all the images together, multiply them, but practically it is conceptually taking each image, taking it to the very end, deciding its loss, finding the gradients, taking the second one. But you don't want to quickly change your training to fit one image. And that's why you take the average weight adjustments of your batch, which is of the set of images in your subset that you're training per iteration. And then is it possible to uh, take into account all the observations? Uh, it would be nice to train on all your data, but usually it's a GPU size limitation. No, no because the, uh, by the nature of the mean, it's uh, sequentially computed. So, uh, uh, we, we can take all the observations from the current, from uh, until the current step without storing them. You can, I think, you can. You really, you really take all of them and store them and then make a decision. That's what they exactly do. And that's why we need lots of RAM. I'll take a final question and then let you break. Usually when we use the term epoch, even though be critical about it, it usually means you went through all your data. So usually an epoch is made out of lots of batches, and by the end of the epoch, you have trained on all your data once. However, as I said, be very critical when you read papers because they can use it, I wouldn't say incorrectly, but differently. I believe we have half an hour of break to catch up, and I'm assuming you return fully fresh. If you have any questions, I'm around.